Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Mirav Galper, a board certified radiologist and section chief for thoracic imaging with the Mid Atlantic Permanente Medical Group. And I am joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Fiona Miller Azraeli, pulmonary medicine lead physician practicing in Baltimore, Maryland, and Dr. Andrew Schussler, pulmonary medicine physician practicing in Washington, D.C. and Maryland suburbs. I will begin today by sharing my experience. I have been practicing as a board certified radiologist with the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group for three and a half years. And prior to this was extremely fortunate to train during my radiology residency at the Leahy Hospital in Massachusetts with Dr. Brady McKee, who pioneered this life-saving lung cancer screening program in 2011. Subsequently, I completed a fellowship at Massachusetts General Hospital. One of the things that drew me to the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group is our multidisciplinary approach to the treatment of lung cancer and the high quality, efficient delivery of care we provide our members. The unique collaboration between our radiologists, pulmonary medicine specialists, thoracic surgeons, and of course, primary care physicians is so important when we're dealing with lung cancer, where early diagnosis and treatment can literally save a patient's life. At this time, I would like to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Meller and Dr. Schisler. Thank you, Dr. Galper. Um, I am a board certified pulmonologist. I trained in internal medicine, pulmonary and critical care medicine at the uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center. In the early uh, part of my career, I was on staff in a teaching position and did some research. Um, but for most of my career, I have been taking care of pulmonary patients over 25 years, actually. And for the last 11 years, I've been with the Mid-Atlantic uh, Permanente Medical Group. And I've taken care of many patients with lung cancer. And that's why I'm especially excited to be here to talk about early screening for lung cancer. Um, now, uh, Andy, um, I'd like to introduce my esteemed colleague, Dr. Andrew Sisler. Thank you so much, Dr. Meller. I, I'm also very excited to be a part of this event. I'm a board certified pulmonologist. I did my training in internal medicine at New York Presbyterian Hospital, and then went on to do pulmonary and critical care training at Brigham and Women's Hospital. While I was in Boston, I developed skills in what's called advanced bronchoscopy. And it's really just a fancy way of saying that I look inside the lungs with a camera and uh, I use that camera and some fancy tools to diagnose cancer and see if it's uh, spread to any of the nearby lymph nodes or other parts of the lungs. When I finished fellowship in Boston, I was eager to move back to the DC area where I grew up and I joined the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group about three years ago. I love working with this team and, and one of my favorite aspects of this team is our multidisciplinary approach to care. Thank you so much, Dr. Meller and Dr. Schisler. As you can see between the three of us, we have been working many years taking care of patients with lung cancer and are therefore very excited to be talking to you today about new guidelines to screen younger, lighter smokers for lung cancer. As some of you know, the US Preventive Services Task Force recently, as of last month, issued new guidelines expanding eligibility requirements for CAT scan or CT lung cancer screening. Now with the expanded guidelines, people as young as 50 who are current or past smokers within the past 15 years, who have smoked the equivalent of one pack of cigarettes a day for 20 years are eligible to enroll in a CT lung cancer screening program. Now, you may be surprised to learn that despite significant advances in smoking cessation, lung cancer remains the number one cause of cancer death in the United States. Last year alone, roughly 230,000 people were diagnosed with lung cancer, and sadly, nearly 136,000 died of the disease. The prognosis is not so great, with an overall survival rate of about 20%. If detected early, however, the five-year survival rate can be as high as 95%. Now with recommendations stating that CT for lung cancer screening should begin at age 50 for those high-risk patients, 
Physicians like ourselves are hopeful to catch lung cancer earlier and at more treatable stages. Now, while all patients, even non-smokers, can develop lung cancer, the risk is greatest in patients who currently smoke or are former smokers. Last month, as I mentioned, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force revised its guidelines for the first time since 2013, when we first began screening for lung cancer, and announced that patients 50 to 80 years of age who are current or past smokers within the last 15 years and have smoked an equivalent of one pack of cigarettes a day for 20 years should undergo screening. So the take home message is that if you are between the ages of 50 and 80, and if you have smoked the equivalent of one pack of cigarettes a day for 20 years, if you're a current smoker or have smoked within the last 15 years, you are eligible to enroll in a lung cancer screening program. Please speak with your doctor about this. With this in mind, we're going to take you through the whole process of lung cancer screening. Dr. Schisler, can you begin by reviewing with our audience what the risk factors and symptoms for lung cancer are? Of course, um, thanks for asking. So regarding the risk factors, cigarette smoking is the most important risk factor in the development of lung cancer. And I'll say that again, that cigarette smoking is the most important risk factor in the development of lung cancer. And this includes smoking yourself or exposure to secondhand smoke. There are other risk factors, including exposure to some chemicals. People may have heard of asbestos or radon that can increase the risk of lung cancer. But again, I wanna emphasize what we said before that cigarette smoking is the most important risk factor. One thing to add is that occasionally lung cancer can run in families. So it's a good idea to mention to your doctor if any of your close relatives have had a history of lung cancer. Regarding symptoms, it's key to mention that most patients, most patients with early lung cancer have absolutely no symptoms, none. That's why it's so important to screen because you will not know that you have an early lung cancer. Many of the symptoms that patients often mention to me that they associate with lung cancer, such as pain, cough, blood in the sputum, or increased problems breathing are usually only present late in the course of lung cancer. Thank you, Dr. Schisler, for sharing such important information. Um, since smoking is the major risk factor for lung cancer, uh, Dr. Meller, uh, what is your approach to addressing smoking cessation with your patients? Thanks, Dr. Galper. This is a topic that I feel very passionately about. Um, for our smokers, this is one of the most difficult things um, most smokers will ever do in their lives. Uh, for some people, it's a little easier. For uh, most people, it's much more difficult and they need support. And so um, uh, this is especially the case when anxiety is a factor. Um, and um, may have led to uh, someone smoking in the first place. Um, fortunately, at Kaiser, we have many resources uh, to assist with this. We have classes, we have coaching, we have counselors, and of course, all the different medications uh, that we can uh, use as well. We physicians can make a huge impact in uh, somebody's attempt and ultimate success in smoking. And the approach really is a personal one. Um, it needs to be tailored to the needs of the individual patient. A lot of times people come to me saying they've tried numerous times to quit smoking and they have failed numerous times and nothing ever worked. And after we discuss it for a while, it turns out that actually they acknowledge that, you know, maybe I wasn't really committed. Maybe I wasn't really there uh, in wanting to quit. And so that's the first step is really being honest with oneself and being ready to quit. And uh, then it's a matter of uh, support all along the way. And of course, I've got patients who uh, quit and then they relapse. And just the other day, I had a patient come to me. She said, Dr. Miller, you're going to be so mad at me. I started smoking again. And I said, how can I be mad at you? You coming to me, you're telling me the truth. I can't be angry with somebody being honest. And moreover, you're coming to get help. 
And so we made another plan uh, to help her um, have a continue to be successful again. And I must tell you, I have shared many successes with patients and it's always wonderful uh, to uh, hear about it and support them in it. Um, I just want to also point out that the day you quit smoking is the day your risk for uh, lung cancer stops increasing. So there's every reason to quit as soon as possible. The other thing is changes happen in the airways from the day within hours that you stop quitting. There are de decreases inflammation, mucus production. It all starts right away. On the other hand, you need to remember that your smoking history straight stays with you and it still counts. Even after you've quit smoking, it does still count. And so that's what we're uh, addressing now. Uh, Dr. Galpa, would you like to take it from here? Sure, thank you. Uh, these are very important messages and our patients are very lucky to be in your care. Um, at this point, our viewers may be wondering uh, what to expect after they've discussed lung cancer screening with their doctor. Uh, so let me take you through this process. The screening of lung cancer begins with a CAT scan or a CT scan. For this test, you'll be lying flat on an exam table and then the table moves through a donut shaped scanner while you hold your breath for about five to 10 seconds. Uh, and then the table uh, will move through the machine as the actual images are being taken. Now a CT scan for lung cancer screening takes less than five minutes, does not use any dye, has not been a problem for patients with claustrophobia. Um, and the scan uses the lowest possible radiation dose, which is the equivalent of a screening mammogram. At this risk, at this dose, the radiation risk is considered negligible. What happens after is that a board certified radiologist like myself will review all the images very carefully. Lung cancer starts as a few abnormal cells in your lungs, and this manifests itself as a nodule or an abnormal area on your skin. And this is something that radiologists like myself are trained to detect. Now, whether or not the exam is normal, it's important for viewers to realize that lung cancer screening is not a one-time test, but it's a process under the direction of your doctors that may include follow-up of any findings and return for screening every year while you remain eligible. So now speaking of abnormal tests, uh, Dr. Meller, can you tell us a little bit about what patients uh, should expect if the scan does show a concerning finding? Absolutely, thanks Dr. Galper. So a patient will come to me with an abnormal CAT scan, and of course, they're a little concerned to say the least, uh, often very nervous. And um, they uh, come in and we start talking and usually are able to relax a little bit. And I go through a detailed history and physical exam so that I can understand the personal context to this, uh, the imaging findings that we're seeing. I then bring up on my computer screen in the exam room, I bring up those images and I show my patients, they get a crash course on how to read a CAT scan in very simple terms. And I show them what's normal, what's abnormal, and they can see uh, the lesion that we're talking about. And then we delve into a discussion about what the options are going between uh, most conservative and most aggressive. Uh, talking about what each uh, step would involve, the risks and the benefits of each. And now with my patient uh, being uh, an informed uh, person, we can have an a informed uh, discussion about what is best for that patient. And they can ask me questions and uh, we can make the decision together. Sometimes they want more of my own opinion and they come to a, a decision as to what's best. And then right there and then, I can go into my computer, I can schedule um, the appointments they need, the tests they need, uh, often in the same Kaiser facility that we're seated. It may even happen on the same day or within a few days, uh, understanding that this is stressful and we wanna get through this as quickly as possible. And I must tell you that um, quite honestly, most of my patients leave the uh, visit. Uh, feeling quite relieved and are very happy to see that the outlook is actually much more optimistic than they actually anticipated. Um, so I should also note 
that uh, at the Mid-Atlantic Medical Group, we have a weekly multidisciplinary uh, test conference. And um, Dr. Schistler, would you like to tell the audience a little more about that? Absolutely. Thanks so much for bringing this up, Dr. Meller. Um, so every patient with a concerning finding on a lung cancer screening CT is discussed at this weekly multidisciplinary conference that you mentioned. The conference includes usually around six to 10 plus people and it. It has physicians from multiple specialties, including radiology, thoracic surgery, and several pulmonologists or lung doctors. Alongside all the physicians, we have a team of lung trackers who participate in this meeting and they make sure that patients get the appropriate follow-up. During the conference, and I, I love this conference, it's every week and I, I do everything possible to attend it because we have wonderful and robust discussions about what's the best next step for every patient and the abnormalities we saw on the CT. And we then communicate these recommendations to a physician caring for the patient. Thanks, Dr. Schistler. I, I, I completely agree with you. I, I really enjoy our meetings. Um, we have several pulmonologists on and we have differing opinions sometimes. And we are able to discuss them and pros and cons. And then uh, we provide these uh, to the physicians. And I often will tell my patients, if it's, we've had a meeting before the visit, I bring that into uh, the discussion or I'll let them know after the visit. Um, I did want to mention uh, just a couple of pointers to our viewers that I think they may, may find helpful. Um, the first thing is that when you are discussing with your physician, your smoking history, try and be as accurate as you can. Um, we tend to find that as people, we tend to underestimate things when we're looking back in the past. And especially with smoking, um, unintentionally, smokers tend to underestimate their smoking history. And now with the lung cancer screening program, if you do this, you may exclude yourself for, from actually being eligible for lung cancer screening. So please uh, try and uh, be accurate about it. Um, the second point I wanted to raise is that lung cancer screening is different from that of many other cancers. Our smokers know that their habit of smoking has actively contributed to their risk of lung cancer. And this evokes a lot of different emotions, uh, guilt, anxiety, regret. Um, and so it makes it more complex. And it's these emotions that sometimes will get in the way of somebody actually pursuing uh, enrolling in lung cancer screening. Just the very word of hearing lung cancer, this is what they have feared for so many years. And to bring it, bring it to the forefront is just the last thing they wanna do. So I really um, I want to talk to our viewers um, to ask you to please, we've all made mistakes in the past. We've all done things we're not proud of, but we need to move forward. And along with working on quitting smoking, um, let's turn a new leaf, start on being healthier and see lung cancer screening as a way to, uh, for this to be part of being healthier. Um, and, um, the last little thing is to please remember that even through a pandemic like COVID-19, cancer, lung cancer, other cancers, they keep marching through. They don't stop uh, for COVID. And by the same token, we need to keep screening. Uh, so please don't uh, stop in getting your annual uh, screenings. Um, Dr. Galper? Thank you, uh, Dr. Meller. These are such powerful and important messages. Uh, we have a question from the audience about how uh, people can calculate their pack years uh, or their smoking intensity, because that obviously matters in terms of being included or excluded in the lung cancer screening program. Uh, can either you or Dr. Schistler uh, go over that with your audience? Dr. Schistler, would you go ahead? Sure, it's, an, it's, a, it's a really good question. Uh, and it's not necessarily intuitive to, to the people that are tuning into this. 
So in essence, it's calculated based on the average number of packs a day that one has for a total of one year. So a pack year would be the equivalent of one pack or 20 cigarettes a day every day of the year for a whole year. And we recognize that not everybody smokes exactly 20 cigarettes every day of every week. And we recognize that some people, when they go to work, maybe on weekdays, they smoke fewer cigarettes and on the weekends, they smoke more or vice versa. Or some months people are cutting down and other months stressors cause people to increase the amount that they're smoking. And so again, it's, it's an average of how many packs per day you're smoking for a total of one year. So if you smoked one pack per day for a year, that's one pack year. And if you did that for 20 years, that would be 20 total pack years. Dr. Miller, do you have anything else to add on this topic? Well, it's just to just um, add to what you're saying is that correctly, uh, if somebody smokes uh, three packs a day uh, for 10 years, that's a 30 pack year smoking history. Well, whereas if somebody smoked one pack a day for 30 years, that's a 30 pack year smoking history. So I just wanted to give that example to uh, illustrate a little further. Thank you to both of you for clarifying. Ultimately, uh, viewers in our audience, if there is any question or if you think you may be eligible in any uh, in any way based on your smoking, uh, please discuss with your doctor. And of course, uh, they will help you uh, calculate it precisely if there's any question. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of great uh, things today, very important messages. I just want to emphasize again, during this ongoing COVID pandemic, keeping up with health maintenance and all your necessary screening exams is more important than ever. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Meller, Dr. Schisler for joining me to address this important topic of lung cancer screening. Uh, I hope our viewers today have enjoyed this discussion and will be motivated to reach out to their doctor if they think they may be eligible for lung cancer screening. Please do this for yourself, as well as for your family members, your friends, your loved ones, so that you can save your life or theirs. Uh, thank you to everyone who has been watching. If you've enjoyed this and think the information could be helpful to someone you know, please share on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, you can learn more about our integrated multi-specialty medical practice and find lots of great health information on our blog at kp.org slash doctor. From all of us at the Permanente Medical Group, thank you and be well. Thank you, be well. Thank you so much.